Hello, welcome to the 10th Cosmology Talk. This week we have Colin Hill, who is an assistant professor at Columbia and an associate research scientist at Flat Iron Institute. Um, I found a paper of his from about a month ago very interesting. Um, it covered early dark energy in the context of, of H0 and, and other cosmological parameters. And it's interesting because early dark energy is something that I think a lot of people view as maybe a leading contender to explain H0. And the conclusion of their paper was that even if it can kind of reconcile H0 measurements, it then in the process of doing it makes other parameters just as discordant as H0 was in the first place. So to view it as a solution is maybe a bit um, over ambitious, but he'll go into that in a lot more detail, I assume. Um, this is the third talk in a row that is mostly to do with H0. Uh, the channel won't become just a pure H0 channel. Uh, so if you're not interested in H0, stick around. Um, but it is obviously one of the most interesting things in cosmology at the moment. So that's why uh, we've had three in a row. Um, yeah, awesome. So um, thanks, Colin, for joining us. And do you want to briefly summarize what it is you, you do in the paper? Yeah, uh, well, first, thanks for having me. And uh, hello to everybody who's tuning in. Um, yeah, so a sort of brief summary of the paper is that uh, we set out to investigate these early dark energy models, uh, which I'm going to use the word EDE many times, and EDE means early dark energy. Fair enough. Um, and as you mentioned, these have been suggested to resolve the uh, H0 tension uh, between early universe and late universe uh, inferences of, of H0. Uh, the basic punchline of our paper is that we wanted to confront these EDE models uh, with a wider array of cosmological data than had previously been considered uh, in constraining them. Uh, and in particular, the new, uh, if you will, sets of data that we considered uh, were from large scale structure surveys um, in particular, surveys that constrain the growth of structure in the universe in addition to the expansion history. So here, these are things like the Dark Energy Survey, the Hyper Supreme Cam Survey, uh, and then the Kilo Degree Survey. So these are predominantly weak lensing and photometric galaxy clustering surveys. Um, and then the, the punchline of the paper, uh, summarizing it very compactly, is that we found that the early dark energy models that uh, could resolve the H-naught tension uh, run into trouble with these large scale structure data sets. Right, right. So if someone's remembering this talk a few months from now or remem remembering the paper and you want them to just remember a couple of simple things that, that come from the paper in the talk, what would those few simple things be that, that they remember? Yeah, so I guess the first one I would mention is that um, so what happens with these early dark energy scenarios is that in order to fit the Planck data, uh, the primary cos cosmic wave background data, uh, and then the SHU's H0 data, they require shifts in the other cosmological parameters, things like the amount of dark matter in the universe, uh, which then are problematic with our constraints on those parameters from other data sets like DES and, and so on. So that's, I'd say, takeaway one. That's, that's really why these, these scenarios run into trouble. Right. And, uh, and then takeaway two is that uh, if you then do a proper uh, Bayesian analysis of all these data sets, um, what we find is that no, there's no evidence seen for the existence of early dark energy if you do an analysis of Planck plus large scale structure data sets while excluding the shoes data. So if you combine this whole array of cosmological data sets and ask, uh, do they show evidence for early dark energy if you exclude the shoes H0 data? The answer is no. In fact, they put a very tight constraint, a very tight upper bound on any allowed amount of early dark energy. Mm -hmm. And the inferred Hubble parameter that you get from the analysis is in three and a half sigma tension with the shoes direct measurement of H0. So even in this broadened early dark energy parameter space, there's still a discordance in H0, which suggests to me that this EDE scenario is, is not uh, a concordant okay. cosmological. I presume you, you will get into this, but, but I, when you say excluding shoes, I guess you also mean excluding any other direct local measurements of H0, like that's right. strong that's right. time delay stuff and things. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, you, you've sort of answered this already to some extent, but um, if you want to flesh out the background a bit more, why, why did you, you want to do this particular uh, early dark energy? I mean, in my intro, maybe I also went into this a little bit, but. Hey, yeah, can, yeah. You can so expand think, on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can mention sort of the broader context and why I got interested, I guess, sure. uh, yeah. personally. 
Um, I mean, the broader context is kind of what you mentioned. These, these early dark energy models seem like a strong contender to explain this H naught tension. Um, so that's, you know, a large motivating factor is to, yeah. to, to try to understand and constrain these models as, as best as possible. Uh, I was then also personally interested uh, in these because I had investigated similar uh, types of early dark energy scenarios to possibly explain this um, uh, 21 centimeter uh, detection from the EDGES experiment a couple of years ago. So EDGES detected this absorption feature in the, the sky averaged spectrum of uh, 21 centimeter uh, emission or absorption, in this case absorption. Um, and it was puzzling because it was such a deep absorption feature. And it turns out there's a way you can cook up an early dark energy model that would actually explain why it's such a deep absorption feature. I see, uh, I see. But unfortunately, it's ruled out by other by other constraints. But that was yeah. when I first got interested in some of these. And that, that early dark energy would have been not not as early as the CMV early. That's right. Okay, yeah. okay. but just early compared has, to today. Yeah, yeah. It kicks. Okay. It would kick in at redshift of order a few hundred. Okay. Uh, okay doing a very similar thing to what the EDE does for the H naught tension, but it kicks in at a bunch of a few hundred, it briefly accelerates the, the universe. Um, and what happens is that it then causes the uh, gas temperature to decouple earlier than it normally would from the photons. I see. And so then the, uh, the gas has longer to cool by redshift 17. Right. Um, okay. And so then it's a deeper absorption feature for it. So you had the, you had the tools and then when you saw that early dark energy was being used for H naught, you were like, I, I can use these tools. I guess. Yeah, yeah, I had some of the tools. Uh, I hadn't uh, hadn't done the full uh, modification of the uh, Einstein-Boltzmann code oh, right. um, to, to, to handle the perturbations. So I had looked at the background level. For things like the, the average gas temperature and so on, you just need the background evolution. Um, so the, the real, uh, the, I'd say the bulk of the work that we did here was to, to get the implementation correct for the perturbations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should give a lot of credit to my collaborators, Evan McDonough, uh, from Brown, now at MIT, and uh, Michael Toomey from Brown. Uh, those those guys put in a huge amount of effort uh, collaborating to get the, oh, yeah. the Einstein cool. Boltzmann code working. Yeah, awesome. And so, any, anything more you want to say on that on that topic, or if not, we can we can dive into the paper and you can tell us in detail what you did. Um, yeah, I think that the motivation hopefully is pretty clear. I mean, yeah. we just wanted to uh, try to test these CDE scenarios and see if they really work. And I guess if the conclusion had been the other way around that they did work, then that would be super exciting it's like so I mean, yeah 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 i'll say that i was partially motivated also because i had seen i'd read the previous papers and then seen some seminars given by the authors of previous uh early dark energy analyses and one thing i had seen was this tendency for the cosmological parameters to shift in a way that looked to me like it was going to cause problems with no, other right. cosmological data sets and yeah. so i was like have you guys really carefully checked that this works with ges and so on and uh I don't know. I never, yeah, anyways, that was the motivation to then really check it super carefully. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So do you want to maybe bring up uh, your slides and yeah. let's go into the details? Yeah, let me just highlight my collaborators again. So Evan McDonough, Michael Toomey, and Stefan Alexander, who were, at the time we did this, they were all at Brown University. All right, so we've talked a bit about the H-naught tension. Um, this is just a summary plot that I think is nice, which illustrates at the top here, these early universe uh, measurements, for example, from the cosmic microwave background that tend to get this low value around 67 or 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and then the late universe measurements um, led by this shoes measurement that's at around 74. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, many of us in cosmology are hoping to, to figure out. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, let me just give a little bit more detail about the EDE scenario itself. So uh, the motivation pointed out in this uh, series of papers, um, for example, Poulin et al., Smith et al., and others, uh, sort of summed up in this plot. So um, the gray region here is the direct measurement of H naught from shoes, yeah. um, the one and two sigma uh, contours. And then the blue uh, posterior is the posterior on H naught from the Lambda CDM model that's fit to Planck plus BAO data from BOSS and other surveys, supernovae data, and so on. Uh, and that's, you know, the tension is the tension between the gray contour and the, the blue curve. And then in the EDE model fit to those exact same data sets, then you see this increase in, in H naught that mostly resolves the tension. Right. Yep. So the question then is, how does this work physically? Um, and the, the brief way of putting it is that 
the ED, the early dark energy serves to decrease the physical size of the sound horizon that's imprinted in the CMB, which is the standard ruler that lets us, you know, effectively infer an H naught value. Mm -hmm. um, so just briefly recapping how that works. So RS star here is the, the physical sound horizon mm -hmm. imprinted in the CMB, and it's given by this integral of uh, CS, the sound speed of fluctuations, times uh, dz over h of z, evaluated from the beginning of the universe up to the time of recombination. Mm -hmm. So in lambda CDM, that's fully determined by three parameters, the physical densities of baryons, cold dark matter, and photons. Mm -hmm. So we know the photon density from kobe firas which measured the, the mean CMB temperature in the 90s. Um, and then the baryon and cold dark matter densities are inferred from the shape of the acoustic peaks in the CMB. Uh, so then there's just one free uh, parameter that's left uh, to be adjusted in the model, mm -hmm. um, which corresponds to the measured parameter theta s star. So down here at the, the last line, uh, this is basically showing the chain of reasoning that goes from the measurement of the angular size of the sound horizon mm -hmm. to the constraint on h naught. So theta s star, the angular sound horizon, is roughly speaking inversely proportional to the peak spacing between the peaks in the CMB uh, power spectrum. And then um, the angular diameter distance to the surface last scatter is just the ratio of RS star over theta S star. So we need to keep theta S star fixed because that's a measured quantity. Mm -hmm. So then the only thing that can be adjusted um, uh, is an H naught which enters the angular diameter distance according to the, the usual equation down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's roughly speaking the, the chain of reasoning. And if you want to uh, recap this further, there's a nice review from Lloyd Knox and Marius yeah. Malia. Uh, all right, so then roughly speaking in a scenario like early dark energy, um, you get additional flexibility here because you have a new set of parameters that enter the calculation of this physical sound horizon. Mm -hmm. um, RS star. So there's going to be, in our case, three additional new parameters that are, are relevant. OK, so I just have a few slides now to sort of summarize some of the details of how this model has actually been implemented from a more physical perspective. So uh, the simplest way, as is often the case, when you have some new physics is to introduce a scalar field. In this case, it's a, a pseudo-scalar pseudo field, but yeah. scalar field phi. So it, uh, it lives in some potential. Uh, and the idea is that it's uh, initially frozen on its potential due to Hubble friction. Mm -hmm. So the equation of motion for a scalar field in an expanding universe is down here at the bottom. Um, and so if the Hubble parameter is much, much larger than the mass of the field, then the second term dominates over the third term. And you have a very highly damped harmonic oscillator. So it just sits there. Yeah. Then, of course, the Hubble parameter decreases as the universe is expanding. And eventually, it drops below the mass of the field. Uh, and at that point, the field would start to roll. So crucially, while it's frozen, the field acts as dark energy. So its equation of state is W equals minus 1. Um, and of course, this should be you know, familiar um, in some sense from thinking about inflation. Although, of course, in inflation, generally, the field is slowly rolling on a flat potential instead of being stuck by a Hubble friction. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so then eventually Hubble drops low enough and the field rolls down the potential and then it oscillates around the minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, and the effective equation of state at that point will depend on the shape of the potential. Mm -hmm. um, so the oscillatory solution, for example, in the case of m squared by squared potentials written down there at the bottom where it's, it's easy to solve. Uh, for other potentials, it will still be oscillatory, but the um, exact time dependence and so on will be different. Um, so you can work out, uh, roughly speaking, some of the relevant parameters for the early dark energy scenario to resolve the H naught tension uh, just on the back of the envelope. So in order to have some significant impact on the physical sound horizon, in other, in other words, to make some large contribution to that integral of CS dz over H of z, you need to have uh, this field be, be important uh, in the decade or two of scale factor evolution just prior to recombination. Yeah. But then you need to have it go away rapidly, because if this thing is still hanging around, 
later in the universe, then you just mess up everything in cosmology. Right. So you want it to start rolling just before the redshift of last scattering, what I call ZCMB here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that tells you that the mass of the scalar field needs to be about 10 to the minus 27 electron volts. Okay. So it's a very light field. Yeah. Um, and phenomenologically, I think axions or axion-like particles are, are the things that are most well motivated for such for such light field. And is that why it needs to be a pseudo-scalar? Because everything up until then could have just been a scalar field. Yeah, I think that's the predominant motivation. Okay. Yeah. And and also if, if V of phi is m squared phi squared, then it would when it's oscillating at the bottom, it would act like matter, right? So then it wouldn't go yeah, away. Right. So, it's, so yeah. it doesn't have to be even steeper than that to go away quick enough that yeah. it's not around today as dark matter. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So the um, yeah, m squared phi squared would be totally ruled out because you'd mess up all the rest of cosmology. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. So this nice, nicely segues into the, the last okay. point here. Um, yeah, so I've already said the first two points. The third point, as you mentioned, so you need the effective equation of state to be different than zero so that its energy density mm -hmm. contribution mm -hmm. decays fast enough to not mess up the rest of the cosmology. So the canonical potentials that people have considered that appear to work well in the actual data analysis are these axion-like potentials where you have one minus cosine of phi raised to some power. Mm -hmm. So the usual axion would be n equals one, where it's just one minus cosine of phi. Um, uh, phenomenologically, n equals three appears to uh, match the data pretty well. n equals two could also work, but uh, um, n equals two is a little bit harder to handle computationally because the oscillations in this field become very rapid. So we just fixed n equals three throughout. Okay, and then that uh, n equals two would have the conclusions would have been the same, or? Yeah, I think broadly speaking, the, the qualitative conclusions would be the same. All right. Yeah. We may, we may do some runs with free values of n at some point, but mm -hmm. from a theoretical perspective, I think only integer values of n are really motivated. Mm -hmm. So if you think about a non-integer value, then you're effectively tuning an infinite series of terms mm -hmm. in some expansion for the potential. If you have n equals two or n equals three, then you're just tuning like one term or two terms at the beginning of this expansion. Yeah. But yeah, other I think uh, non-integer values would be pretty hard to motivate. Okay. All right, um, good. So then the actual parameters that we use to describe uh, this model. So uh, let me, I'll foreshadow something that we'll come back to later. So the physical parameters that characterize this model, really the mass of the field M, what's called yeah. a decay constant F, mm -hmm. um, and then its initial position on the potential. So those are like the three physical parameters. Then you can convert these into phenomenological parameters, which are more closely connected to what the data can actually constrain. Okay. But uh, I'll come back at the end to discuss how the effective priors in these two parameter spaces relate to each other, which turned out to be okay. uh, something non-trivial. Um, so the way that uh, this has been parameterized by other people, in which we also follow, is to define this FEDE, which is the fractional contribution of the EDE field phi to the cosmic energy budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what it looks like as a function of redshift for a model that can mm -hmm. explain the Hubble tension. So at redshift of a few thousand, this field contributes about 12% of the total cosmic energy budget. So it's a pretty dramatic change to our picture of cosmology. So the, the parameters then used are um, FEDE at the value where this curve peaks. So that, that location is called ZC, the critical redshift. Yeah. Um, and that's very closely related to the redshift when the field actually starts to roll okay. uh, down, down its potential. Um, so that's two of the parameters, FEDE, ZC. And then the final parameter that you need is just uh, the initial field displacement on the, mm -hmm. on the potential. So those are the three, what I'll call effective or phenomenological parameters. And that, that uh, would presumably be set somehow by like some earlier inflationary epoch that drove it up to, to that value and it's been sitting there ever since waiting. Yeah, one interesting thing, which yeah, I'll highlight again in, in a minute is that um, the data do prefer that the field should be very highly displaced from its minimum. Mm -hmm. So I actually alluded to this on my 
my cartoon of the potential mm -hmm. here. So th this is the potential one minus cosine of phi, uh, oh, right. the yeah. third. Um, and the initial field value is indeed preferred to be right near pi. So oh, it's I see. I see. about as highly displaced as it can be. Mm -hmm. All right, so the reason that everybody, or many people anyway, got excited about these scenarios is that uh, you can maintain a good fit to the CMB power spectrum uh, while increasing H naught significantly. Mm. So this is a, a plot uh, showing the CMB temperature power spectrum on the left in a lambda CDM model that fits the Planck data with H naught of 68.2 um, and an early dark energy model that also fits the Planck data with H naught of 72.2. Mm, okay. And as you can see, they're basically indistinguishable. So the plot yeah. on the right shows the fractional difference, and okay. it's at the level of sub percent differences. Mm. Wow. So yeah, this is it's pretty cool. Um, and again, the, the physics of this is, is pretty straightforward. It's just caused by this decrease in, in the sound horizon that I mentioned earlier. Mm. I will mention, though, that uh, getting, the, getting the salt to work properly does depend on including the behavior of the perturbations in the EDE field uh, self-consistently. I see. Okay. So although initially its equation of state W is equal to minus one, um, so at that point, uh, you know, there's no perturbations to consider, right. just like a cosmological constant doesn't have perturbation. Mm -hmm. But as soon as W starts to deviate from minus one, then this field develops perturbations, and you have to track those Okay, okay. All right, so that's the CMB. So then the natural next question to ask is what about the large scale structure of the universe? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I found interesting, going back to the motivations of the project, was that nobody had made a plot of the matter power spectrum, P of K. Mm -hmm. um, so we set out to do this. Um, and now anybody can. So we made our modified version of this Boltzmann code public. Uh, the Boltzmann code class. Um, so you can check this out on GitHub class EDE. Uh, there's a whole set of notebooks there, which um, Michael Toomey put together, one of my collaborators, uh, which are very pedagogical and will show you how to do the calculations. Oh, cool. So uh, something fun to, to play around with. All right, so then here's, here's an actual plot. So this is the matter power spectrum. Uh, P of K at, mm. uh, I guess, a variety of redshifts from zero to roughly one. Mm -hmm. uh, so lens CDM is in black and the EDE model is in red dashed. These are the same exact models that were plotted for the CMB mm. a couple of slides ago. Right. So although the CMB power spectrum was basically identical, you see that there are no trivial differences in the matter right. power spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On a, on a log scale like this, it looks like they match pretty well but we've of course measured measured the matter distribution quite accurately so even small differences and on quite. the right it's it's far more obvious yeah exactly so on the right it's the ratio between these um predictions at different redshifts uh, and you see that you know for example a k of 0.1 inverse megaparsec it's of order a few percent difference which is pretty significant right um, i mean but it gets as big as 10 percent or or even yeah, so if you, go to, if you keep going to smaller scales, then it becomes larger and larger. But, or uh, even at larger is, scales, it's a order of 5% at 10 to the minus 3. Or is cosmic variance mean that that's not... So yeah, cosmic variance, cosmic variance starts to kick in out there. Okay. So I had a slide, which I think I had cut in interest of brevity, uh, but there's a plot in the paper that you can find which shows the rough range of wave numbers that the Dark Energy Survey has probed. I see. Um, so they have to make a cut at high K to remove scales that are contaminated by nonlinearities. Right. Uh, and then they're bound at lower k is limited by the size of the sky patch. Yes. That they okay. can. So you, you fixated in point 0.1 just now when you were talking because that's like the most observationally relevant scale, I guess. That's right. That's okay, right. cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the question is what, uh, what was causing this to happen? Is this due to some early dark energy related physics or is it something else. So then this, to explain this, let me go back then and say, um, one could have kind of guessed that this is going to happen. It's really driven by parameter shifts in the so-called normal cosmological parameters mm -hmm. in this early dark energy scenario compared to uh, Lambda CDM. 
So this is a figure from Smith et al, um, which kind of nicely shows what's happening. So these are posteriors uh, in the normal Lambda CDM parameters mm. uh, for a fit to this array of data sets, Planck uh, CMB plus CMB lensing plus shoes plus BAO and so on. Yeah. Uh, and what you see is that um, you get this increase in H0, of course, which is the success of the EDE model. But there's also a large increase in the physical cold dark matter density, omega CDM. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that that's needed is that the early dark energy field is acting to slightly suppress the growth of perturbations in the same way that dark energy today is suppressing the growth of mm -hmm. perturbations in logical mm -hmm. structure. Uh, in, in the CMB language, this would be called an early ISW effect, early integrated sex wolf effect. Uh, so to compensate that, you have to crank up the amount of cold dark matter in order to keep the CMB unchanged. I see. So otherwise, the peak heights would would drop. Yeah, exactly. You okay. get you get the amplitude, and then also the detailed shape. I see. So you introduce the early dark energy to change like the locations of the peaks, but then it would change the amplitude. So you need to omega matter has to change to. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's actually I think interesting at some level that the other parameters can actually compensate in just the right way to keep the fit good. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, but yeah, it, it is a significant shift. Uh, and then the other shift that's noticeable is that the scalar spectral index NS right. also increases. Um, and that's basically just because you're suppressing the growth a little bit uh, as a function of scale L. And so you have to change the tilt a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the upshot then, if you look at the predicted value of the amplitude of P of K as quantified by this S8 parameter, mm -hmm. which is basically sigma eight um, times the square root of omega M divided by 0.3, uh, you see that it predicts uh, S8 of about 0.84 and the measurements of this parameter from weak lensing surveys are in the range of about 0.77. Mm -hmm. So it, it exacerbates this tension between um, weak lensing or large scale structure more generally and the CMB. Mm -hmm. So that's, these parameter shifts are what are responsible for the change in the matter power spectrum. So the dominant effect really is that you crank up the amount of cold dark matter um, and then that ends up increasing the predicted amount of uh, density fluctuations at late times, mm -hmm. which is why the EDE curves here are higher on small scales than the uh, lambda CDM curves. Right. But there is also a couple of interesting physical effects that are caused by the early dark energy itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's illustrated in these plots. So on the left, what we're seeing here is the ratio of the matter power spectrum in an EDE cosmology to a lambda CDM cosmology. Mm -hmm. um, so the fiducial value we used in the previous plot was 0.12, which is the red curve. And then okay. this shows what happens as you crank up or down the amount of early dark energy. Okay. Uh, and effectively, what you see is that if you crank up the amount of early dark energy, then you get more suppression of the power spectrum on small scales. Um, and you can even pinpoint the scale where it's happening. So on the top axis, I've indicated this vertical bar. And everything to the right of that are the modes that were within the horizon at the redshift ZC when the early dark energy field started to roll. So those modes were all within the horizon at that time. And so they are getting affected by this early dark energy suppression. And then the modes on very large scales, those didn't re-enter the horizon until you know the last 10 KD years or whatever. So they're not affected. So just kind of if I can clarify you. In the plots on the left, there's no fitting to data here. It's just with all of the other parameters fixed, you change FEDE. So omega matter isn't isn't like changing to fix the CMB. It's just literally just this parameter changing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So these other models here would not fit the the CMB. So why why is there an increase? Yeah. So if you get rid of this early dark energy, then it the suppression that it would have caused is no longer present. And so omega matter now is at this higher value. Oh, okay. So okay, I get, I get it. Okay. So so the, yeah. Okay. So so you've changed FEDE, but left omega matter as its new value to fit FEDE of 0 0.12. If that makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. We left okay. omega matter where it was. Uh, and then the plot on the right is a similar exercise where instead we vary this critical redshift uh, ZC. 
Uh, and it's the same type of thing. So you, if, if ZC is pushed to lower redshifts, uh, this, uh, the gray curve here is down, down to ZC of 1,000, mm -hmm. um, then you push this scale uh, denoted by the vertical bar in the left plot to larger scales. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see the suppression happening all the way down to you know, K of uh, 10 to the minus 2 mm -hmm. uh, in that case. Mm -hmm. So I think that all you know, physically makes sense. Mm -hmm. So these, these effects do enter into the prediction of P of K as well, but really the dominant effect um, is, the, is the overall shift in the cosmological parameters, the normal cosmological parameters that happen. All right, so now let me come to the actual data analysis. So we put in a whole battery of different cosmological uh, data sets. So this was the first um, early dark energy analysis that used the Planck 2018 data. Um, which is similar to 2015, but the value of tau, the optical depth, has changed a little bit. Okay. Um, we also have CMB lensing from Planck, the shoes measurement of H0, uh, a variety of BAO data sets, um, the most constraining of which is the, the BOSS data um, from Sloan, mm -hmm. type 1A supernovae, which probed the expansion history. Um, we treat those as an uncalibrated um, probe of the relative distances in the expansion history. And then if you include shoes, then that provides a, yeah. a low redshift calibration. Okay. Um, Redshift-based distortions from BOSS. Um, the error bars on those are unfortunately pretty big, so they don't play a huge amount of constraining. They don't impose a huge amount of constraining power in the final analysis, but we include them. Uh, and then the new wrinkle here is the inclusion of the dark energy survey year one data. So this is what they call the three by two point likelihood which includes photometric galaxy clustering, um, the cross-correlation of galaxies with weak lensing, and then the weak lensing autocorrelation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, good, and then, <clears throat> so we include the full DES likelihood, um, which is computationally pretty expensive. Okay. Um, but we include the full likelihood there. One question that we then asked ourselves was, could we get away with actually just including the S8 constraint from DES um, instead of doing the entire likelihood. It wasn't obvious to us that that was a safe thing to do in an early dark energy analysis because you're assuming kind of different cosmology than what they assumed when they derived their S8 constraint. Right. But we ran two parallel analyses and then compared them at the end. And it turns out that if you just had done an S8 prior alone, it actually pretty much contains all of the constraining power of, of DES. Um, so then based on this comparison that we have done, did with these two different types of DES analyses, uh, we use that to motivate inclusion of the HSC and KIDS data at the level of just the S8 constraints, which made them much more computationally uh, efficient to include. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this nice code called Cobaya by Anthony Lewis and Jesus Dorado, which they just put out a paper about that the other day. So yeah, yeah. we use that for the MCMC sampling. Okay, so uh, there's a variety of analyses in the paper, but I'm just going to skip to a couple of the main punchline analyses. Okay. So this one um, is um, an analysis that basically includes the whole kitchen sink. <laughs> so the, uh, the red contours here are the Lambda CDM model fit to all of the data sets that I listed uh, on the previous slide, except for the kids in HSC, right. which are only included in the final green contours. Mm -hmm. um, the blue contours are the kitchen sink fit to this early dark energy model. Mm -hmm. And then the green is uh, everything that I mentioned plus these S8 priors from kids and NHSC. Mm -hmm. So what you end up seeing is that, um, so looking just at the H0 panel, which is the one that the arrow points to here. Yeah. So the gray contours up there are the shoes only measurement of H0. Yeah. Um, in the context of Lambda CDM, you get this red posterior, and there's the tension, basically. Yeah. Now, if you go to this EDE model, uh, if one looked at this analysis without including the DES kids or HSC data, then you would have gotten what I showed a minute ago from the Smith et al. paper, which we also yeah. reproduced. It shifts up enough to be lying within the shoes uh, region. Mm -hmm. Now, if you include DES, it pushes it back down towards mm -hmm. lower H0, and then including kids and HSC pushes it back down towards even lower H0, hmm. which is exactly what we basically expected to happen because of this problem with S8. 
So mm -hmm. down in the lower right hand corner, um, I plotted sigma eight, which captures the main sort of uh, features. So you see that in going from lambda CDM to EDE, it's trying to go up to these larger values of sigma eight that are needed to fit the CMB data. Mm -hmm. But then when you're including DES and HSC and kids, it's trying to pull you back down towards these yeah. lower sigma eight values. All right, so then, yeah, formulated in terms of the EDE parameters themselves, this is what the posteriors look like. So this is an, the analysis that is the whole kitchen sink, um, and it includes shoes, I should highlight. So shoes is what's driving the detection of the EDE. And even with shoes included here, we still basically just get an upper bound on FEDE. So there's mm. not, not strong evidence um, of its existence. Um, one thing I'll highlight is that, yeah, you do see that uh, this large initial field displacement is preferred in the, the third column. So that's the initial field displacement. I see. Um, so for, you know, for the model that could fit the data, it would require uh, a critical redshift that's around matter radiation equality. So the second column here is the critical redshift. Um, and then and the, the third column is the displacement, which has to be uh, pretty large. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I think is funny is that the analysis here gives H naught of 70.00, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Plus something is almost 1.00. Yeah. Maybe, maybe nature's trying to tell us something. I don't know. Um, good. So then uh, what we thought would be an interesting thing to do, given this result, is to then ask, what do all these cosmological data sets give if we excluded shoes, mm -hmm. so just ask, you know, if we try to constrain this model using everything else except shoes, what do we find? So that's what this um, this shows. So red here is lambda CDM, and blue is the EDE cosmology, mm -hmm. um, and this is all the data sets but without shoes. <laughs> um, and the basic punchline is that um, there's no major shifts that are seen. Yeah. So in particular, the H naught value does not shift upward. It shifts upward a little bit, and the posterior also broadens a bit, which makes sense because you have three free, three additional free parameters. Mm -hmm. But um, it it does not shift up to be consistent with with shoes mm -hmm. on its own, which I guess this shows a little bit more clearly. So this is now looking at the posteriors in the the early dark energy parameter space, um, and this is comparing now red here is fit to everything including shoes, and then the blue is the fit to everything without shoes. Mm -hmm. So what you see is basically that if you're including shoes, then you have some moderate evidence. I would say it's, it's not strong evidence, it's like two sigma. Uh, but then if you don't include shoes, then there's just a very strong upper bound mm. with, with no real hint of a detection. Mm. Um, yeah, so formally the upper bound is that FED is less than 0.05 at 95% confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I think is a, a nice way to then kind of capture the conclusion here is that the H naught tension is still um, present. So yeah. if you then look at the tension between the inferred value of H naught here in the analysis without shoes and then compare to the shoes only constraint, then the tension is about three and a half sigma. So it's a little bit less than what it would be in lambda CDM, which is 4.4 sigma, but it's still a pretty significant tension. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, fundamentally, it's just coming from this problem that you can't shift the parameters in the way that's needed for the CMB uh, without messing up the, the large scale structure data. Um, OK, so just summarizing these parameter constraints, um, there's too many contours on this figure, but it just shows the sequence of adding additional data sets and then what happens. Mm -hmm. So the two things to highlight are that the one combination that really does indicate some kind of detection is the one that was considered in the previous works, which is shown in blue here. Mm -hmm. So in the first panel, that's the one that peaks at FED of order 10%. Mm -hmm. um, so that combination is the one that was considered previously. And indeed, that's the one that seems to show some evidence. Uh, but then as soon as you include large scale structure in green or in yellow, it pushes you back down because of this problem that we've mentioned with sigma eight. Uh, and then lastly, the the teal cyan contours show what you get in this analysis uh, without including shoes, mm. um, which I think very kind of clearly illustrates that it's only the inclusion of these low redshift direct H naught measurements that 
that leads to the preference for really dark energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a nonlinear relation between the physical scalar field parameters like the mass and the decay constant and these effective oh, yeah, parameters F E D E and Z C. Right. So it turns out that putting uniform priors on F E D E and log 10 of Z C mm -hmm. is actually a very non uniform priors on those physical scalar field parameters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what implicitly was being done, and in fact it is being done in this plot, for example, is that you're putting um, a prior on new Planck scale physics. So the decay constant uh, prior has significant prior weight at decay constants that are larger than the Planck scale. Oh, I see, I see. So it wasn't something that anybody had. And not just prior out. weight, but also like posterior weight then yeah, there was significant weight in the posterior that's wow. also in that region. I yeah. see, I see. That, yeah, okay, that's an important to point out. <laughs> so this is just showing the effective priors on, um, so log 10 of the decay constant in units of the Planck mass, mm. and then log 10 of the scalar field mass, mm. um, if you're putting uniform priors on these effective parameters, which is what everybody's been doing for the data analyses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. What you see, as, as pointed out, is that there's significant prior weight at greater than zero, uh, which would be one, one, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I see. I mean, it's exciting if true, but it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, from a theoretical perspective, it might be a little bit uh, ill motivated. Yeah, yeah. It would be important to look at the model in much more detail if, if we were really seeing strong evidence for it right. because of this issue. Okay. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. Um, oh. We don't see evidence for the early dark energy if we leave out shoes. Um, the tension with shoes persists even in this model. And physically, it's, it's all due to this trade-off between increasing H0, uh, which then wants to increase sigma 8, and then that worsens the fit to the, the large-scale structure data. Um, so we are working on a couple of sort of small extensions to this. Um, Mm -hmm. One of them is that people had raised some concerns about whether uh, it's valid to use BAO and redshift space distortion results in these um, exotic mm -hmm. cosmologies. So mm -hmm. one way to get around this is to instead just predict everything from first principles, uh, which is what this effective field theory approach to large scale structure does. So we're not, we've actually combined the effective field theory approach to large scale structure with our early dark energy code. Um, mm -hmm doing an analysis with that. Oh, cool. But yeah, then the other major takeaway is that I think people should uh, probably go back to the drawing board and <laughs> think a little bit harder about how to, how to make yeah. these models work, yeah. Your last slide did go into this, so uh, maybe you don't have a lot to add, but, um, but yeah, wh where to next? Yeah, well, so those are some of the things we're doing in this context. Um, I do want to highlight uh, that there's exciting uh, measurements that are going to come out very soon. So I'm a member of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope collaboration, yeah. um, ACT. And uh, I can't tell you what our measurements say, but uh, stay tuned in the next, uh, I'll say, couple of months, maybe sooner, uh, for, our, for our next round of cosmological um, parameters from, from the ACT uh, okay. power spectra. I see, I see. Um, from, from the pure temperature and polarization or also from lensing results or just like all of the above? Yeah, these papers will focus on the primary CMB power spectra, but we do also have lensing measurements and okay. such as well. Um, yeah, one thing that I think is interesting is that our constraining power uh, predominantly comes from the TE, uh, predominantly from the TE power spectrum, mm -hmm. um, whereas Planck is dominated by TT. Mm -hmm. So they're not only complementary in the sense that they're totally different data sets, mm. uh, but they're also complementary in that the observables that dominate the constraining power are, okay. are, are different. Um, and I can't tell you what the measurements are, but I can tell you that our error bars are at a level that is uh, interesting. Uh, all right, let's okay. say well, in, well, in we'll the ballpark. Stay tuned. We will yeah. all stay tuned. Um, uh, I have two more questions, um, but before I ask them, I just want to clarify if I understood something correctly. So th there's, I, I think uh, that paper by Knox and uh, Malaya, um pointed this out, that if you just change the sound horizon, that kind of fixes the H naught problem. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is what early dark energy is meant to do. It's meant to change the sound horizon. And so is it correct to say that the reason why that doesn't work in the end is that 
the early dark energy itself kind of suppresses the the amplitude of the um, perturbations then, and you need to increase omega matter for that. It's not the actual changing of the sound horizon. So if someone out there listening to this can think of a different way of changing the sound horizon, that that might itself still solve it. It, it was yeah. kind of integrated sex wolf decaying of That's the potentials right. that was the Thanks. problem, which is potentially unique to early dark energy. Is that all correct? Yeah, it's this early ISW effect okay. that causes a problem. So, okay. yeah, I, I mean, you need to have uh, some kind of contribution to the energy density of the universe that um, can somehow change the background in the way that's needed to change the sound horizon just through that integral mm. C D Z over H of C S D Z over H of Z, but then does not act to suppress the growth of perturbations at the, level, at the level of perturbations. Which is probably quite difficult. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's so uh, one question I want to ask you, and I didn't give this to you in advance, so I might be putting you on the spot a little bit, but what would you think uh, is the most probable explanation of H naught slash the general discordance? If you had to to pick something, what, what would you pick? Well, I'll say that my thinking on this issue has been influenced um, by measurements, largely speaking. Okay. So a few years ago, when the only discordant measurement was shoes, I didn't pay that much attention. Mm -hmm. Then when the strong lensing time delay measurements came out, that seemed to provide consistent high values uh, with shoes, I started to pay a lot more attention and started to think about models like this. Yeah. But then very recently, there's been these new measurements from Wendy Friedman's team, mm. the uh, Carnegie Chicago Hubble program using the tip of the red giant branch. Mm. Um, and they find a measurement that's you know 69.8, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty consistent with the rest of cosmology. Mm -hmm. which now makes me go back to the situation of thinking that maybe the most likely explanation is some kind of observational systematics. I mean, yeah, but just I'm not more an than one observational systematic now, rather, but maybe that's still the, yeah, that's, the that's minimal right, that's path right. to, um, to concordance. Yeah. Yeah. There've been a couple of papers that pointed out that the strong lensing time delays could be, or in fact are sensitive to assumptions uh, about the shape of the, the lens, mass distribution yeah um, although they've already so, had responses to those papers so yeah, yeah it's okay. hard to keep up with all these things but uh but, but that's one possibility there in terms of the the measurements uh, using the distance ladder the, the the i i shouldn't speak to any i'm not a full expert on the details of all sure. their the analyses there but yeah um i don't know at this point if i had to put down money i would say that observational systematics would still be the Occam's on the, on the local universe side. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm relatively confident. I'd talk, I'm very confident, in fact, that I, I don't think that uh, co the cosmological measurements from CMB and so on are mm -hmm. okay, cool. are biased by systematics. And one one major reason for that also is that you can do this alternative approach where you discard the CMB entirely and you just use big bang nucleosynthesis yeah, yeah, plus yeah. BAO plus DES or or other cleansing measurements and, and that gives 67, 68. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the actual last question outside of your own research, what do you think is the most interesting thing in cosmology at the moment? Yeah, there's a lot of different things I could say. Um, one that uh, I'm very excited about, I'm not formally a member of the, uh, the DESI team, but uh, DESI, the, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, they've now started taking data and uh, I'm really, really excited to, to see what their um, data looks like. Um, so that'll be awesome. That is kind of connected to my research because I do things like cross correlations with galaxy surveys. So, so that's not totally independent. One thing that is much more independent, um, which is sort of a longer term horizon is uh, using gravitational wave standard sirens to constrain mm -hmm. the Hubble constant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's gonna take a few years to beat down the, uh, the noise just because yeah. you have to wait for enough systems, but mm -hmm. I feel like that could really settle this question of whether this is a real physical. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very on. clean and very independent of of other stuff. So yeah, yeah, because yeah. the strong I lensing is independent, but but not so clean. I guess there's a lot of modeling that has to be done. But and they do do it blind, but like I mean, yeah, it's still. Yeah, it uh, it seems yeah. I feel like the gravitational waves, at least to me, seem like the uh, the cleanest low redshift thing that anybody has feasibly thought of. Um, yeah, and then one other topic that I do work on from time to time, but 
that I always think is worth thinking about more is primordial non-Gaussianity. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people felt that after Planck, that primordial non-Gaussianity was dead. But uh, for one, I think that, uh, well, let me just say that I, I think it's still a super, super interesting topic. And uh, I think it's worth trying to think of ways, different observational probes or physical effects that we could use to, to push down constraints on mm -hmm. primordial non-Gaussianity. Um, I mean, in terms of our knowledge of the early universe, it's kind of like we can hope to detect tensor modes in CMB, but there's no guarantee about that. Um, we can hope to detect maybe running of the spectral index, but we're still quite a ways off from doing that. And so I think probably primordial non Gaussianity is our best hope in the next, uh, I don't know, several yeah. years. To and and to measuring it to be zero is still giving us a lot of information about the early universe. And, and if we didn't, if we totally. measured it to be non-zero and managed to then sort of explore the, the, three-dimensional tri-spectrum space, then there's so much, um, sorry, bi-spectrum space, there's so much, um, yeah. I mean, there's all these papers on sort of like cosmological collider physics where they're sort of saying, you're yeah. sort of probing cross-sections by, by measuring non gaussianity So yeah, that's definitely. Um, yeah, I find that uh, to be super cool and that's always, always something fun to think about. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, if you liked the video, please don't forget to subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified and uh, click like to help with the YouTube algorithms and share the channel with colleagues. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment. Uh, while you're here, you might want to watch another video. Um, Colin mentioned ACT. There was a, a good talk about the ACT lensing map by Omar Darwish a few weeks ago. Um, Jurek Bauer also gave a talk a few weeks ago about, um, uh, it was a little unrelated about ultralight dark matter, but arising from the, this axiverse sort of thing that would also be um, it's another axion model that would be um, similar in fundamental physics to, to the one that we cause early dark energy, but because it has different masses and, and, and things, it would act like dark matter. Um, and thanks again, Colin, for the, uh, for the really interesting talk. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, if anybody has questions out there, feel free to uh, send me an email, and I'm always happy to talk further. <laughs>